Our subject is on excellence. And um, excellence refers to people that do whatever they do to the best of their ability. So that when I have some grandchildren, when my grandchild, who is three years, counts one to ten well, they are excellent. Am I communicating? But then you invite the students and you count, it doesn't impress me. Am I communicating? I might talk, you might have to teach me chi squared, whatever that is. Because you are now a university student. So that when we talk about excellence, it's not, comp it's not comparing with anybody else. It's simply you yourself. Given the capacity God has given you, are you operating at your very best? I, and, I, I, and I think it's important. When I was, when I was still working for, for a multinational company, one of my big jobs as a manager was to be involved in recruiting people, trying to find out how can you get somebody with excellence. And our expert in London had said you can always tell a young person who is excellent in three ways. Would you like to know? That's what we look for in the interview, as we interview young people. And we want, we are multinational, I think that the company was paying well. So many young people who are willing to come. In fact, I remember one time we were recruiting engineers, and everybody who came for the interview had first class, first class owners in engineering. So they are all first class owners. So what do you look for? What are you looking for if they are all equal? And we are told by industrial psychologists, experts, there are three things you can look for if you are looking for somebody of excellence. Number one, a person of excellence has analytical capacity. They are not the kind of people told, this is the way people are. Yes, that's the way they are. Kikuns are things. Now, the person telling you has never done a, a census. He cannot give you any report that showed that the uh, Kikuyus are one million in Kenya. And 40% of them are all stolen, and it's probably in court. <laughs> then they were able to get me together, and they are just have a million people. And 20% of them are the only ones who are stolen. Therefore, Kikuyus are thieves. People of excellence are analytical. They don't hear motherhood statements and carry them. Because your mother says, therefore it is. No, you must give me some analysis. Capacity. Analytical capacity. And they tell you during the interview, please try to find out. Because if people don't have that capacity, they cannot become excellent in whatever job you will give them. And it doesn't matter whether you studied engineering or studied chemistry or whatever you studied, it's not the issue. There are people that, that do not think, they just think. Why did they? How do you get fast fast class owners? By repeating what the teacher said. But they themselves never did an analysis. They simply repeat it. The trouble you have with our examination system, they test how well you can remember rather than how you can analyze. But people who are excellent are not people who have good memories. They are people who ask questions and actually analyze. The same thing. Somebody doesn't come with a new teaching. And they tell you, yes, it's new, it's good. Something is not good because it's new. You must analyze why it is good. You see a cow and she's still eight, you tell her I want to marry her. Now that's not analysis. <laughs> she never contributed to her figure eight. That's the way she was born. You don't marry a cow because she's figure eight. After all, after three children, you'll be a girl. So you need to understand. <laughs> So that's not the reason. You must be somebody who thinks. Yeah, when you see a man like if you saw me in my earlier years when Rebecca met me, my hair was up to here. I used to have a natural hairstyle. <laughs> so if that's what attracted Rebecca, after 40 years of marriage, the hair seemed to be running away. <laughs> and it's starting going back to this way and then you can meet you. So they are going to meet somewhere. Now you need to understand clearly. If you are not an analytical, your, your mind is in trouble. Because all you did was you saw a figure? Yes. Or you saw Afro? Yes. yes. I'm not communicating. So we need to understand people of excellence. 
Do not accept things. No, I don't think to be a Christian means not to be an heretic. No. God gave us a prayer to become an heretic. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, when a prophet talks, when someone speaks in tongues, we who are listening must wait. Have you read that in 1 Corinthians 14? That means, if I preach and I'm preaching nonsense, and then, Amen! Amen! You are not an heretic. You are pro excellence. And then an excellent person listens to what the preacher is saying and then waits, considers. Not everything a preacher says needs to be believed and practiced. I'm not going to give you. So it's important to, to understand. And it's a big deal that we are getting university students joining cows. You ask them why did you join the cows? They were jumping better. Now, surely, the church of jumpers is not better than the church of sitters because that's not a requirement for heaven. I'm not going to give you. So you need to, have, to tell me what is it? Give me a reason. I want to find that girl. Why? Huh? I, want, I want to do mathematics. Why? I want to do this career. Why? An analytical person is a person who considers. They never do anything before they have thought about it. That's why my book, my small book called Discovering Your Right Faculty, and I realize you are right actually helps you to have clarity of how to analyze issues. Because the moment you are clear why you are created, then everything you need, you'll be questioning it against it. Is it going to help me to be do what God wanted me to do? And even if somebody is offering you a very high salary, you can't go to it. If that high salary is taking you away from God's calling, I'm not going to give you. I think you don't even know where you are going. <laughs> if the situation is okay, am I right? So you can't be that category and claim to be a man of excellence. Who you do something? Why do you? Because my uncle did it. But your uncle is himself. Don't be extra. Your uncle is enough to be an uncle. So why try to be him? You must tell me why you do what you want to do. Don't do something because others are doing it. You must have analytical capacity. And unfortunately, many people in pastors' honors are not analytical. So that's why you give them a problem. They see a barrier. They come back. Oh, I could not work. Why? I, 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 I you told me this, but this is what is happening. They can't analyze and see what I told them was adequate to have even the new problem. Because they are not analytical. Even in God's work, we require people who are analytical. And that, I found that very interesting because when I'm, when I'm employing people, Sometimes you go by the degree, so it's faster as soon as you take it. But then you take somebody else with another second degree. When they come working and you give them issues, the guy with a lower class degree tends to come up with, you know, they are not even doing the exams. It's not memory, it's analysis. The issue is here. How do you handle it? Let me give you an example. I have two engineers. They both are doing projects. They both must go through data book. But then the telephone has too many uh, issues to discuss in the telephone. Both of them are good engineers, fast class owners. But one engineer is, gives the center of the telephone, the, 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 I, would like this, I would like this to go to the telephone. He has told, ah, that day shall be too busy. I don't think, it, 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 let it come before a man's telephone, assuming the telephone is once a man. The other one is to say, please, if you, if you did it by a man, the consequences are the following. Really, it's a year seven years in the list of items that could be replaced. He talks and shows the person why this project is more important than many other projects. Finally, this project is put in. I, as their boss, in the end, one finishes his project on time, the other one is later. It has nothing to do with the degrees they got. It's the fact that these have the capacity to analyze in order to have the case. I'm not going to get it. So you can see, you can apply somebody because they have a degree, but when they do not see a problem and analyze it, they end up in their own positions. And you start wondering, how come this guy who was slow a second is the one with the boss of the one who went first class? Or not? Because the grade, the grade of your degree only allows you to get a job. Promotions depend on your analytical skills. Because you see, by the time they promote you, it will be on performance. And performance is totally related to the degree you got. 
is your ability to face the problem of this today and analyze them. So when you talk about excellence, it means a person must be analytical. If you are analytical, you can tell you are taking too much time on one subject and yet you have five subjects. I'm not going to give you. But if you are not analytical and you enjoy chemistry and you take chemistry and physics, you put all your time to chemistry, so you pass chemistry with flying colors and physics with crawling ones. You know crawling colors? Will you go on to the next year? Will you be able to go to next year? No, because you are not able to balance the time. You do not analyze. In fact, although I enjoy this one, I'm not taking too much time. Even this one also matters. Am I supposed to allocate it? Time. Because you're not analyzing your time. So people of excellence have analytical minds. But that's not enough to do their daily existence. We were told, number two, we must be busy looking for drive to achieve self motivation. You can be analytical, but you easily give up. You know, you 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 are you are, you are a person who analyzes, but then you are negative you are, in your attitude, you think it will fail, in a way from the family I come from, nobody has never gotten a degree, even if I fail, they will know our family never passes. So you have you are bright to analytical, but you have no motivation. You require motivation from others. This category of people are, I'm telling you, and they cannot be people of excellence. Uh, I call them Urubaru people. You know, the difference between a Urubaru and a car or a tractor on the farm, both of them are very useful. I grew up on the farm and used to carry it because my, I come from Nyadama and we're selling cabbages. You carry until your back is breaking, until we got a Urubaru. Now you can put the whole bag on the Urubaru and you take it all the way to the place where they are. They are buying the, the cabbages. But if only you could get a tractor, there's a difference. A wheelbarrow, you put it, you carry it to the sun, you stop it there, it stops. A wheelbarrow will be there until next time you lift it, isn't it? A tractor, you put the things on the tractor, start the engine, it takes itself. Am I right? No more efforts. Some people are tractors, others are And a wheelbarrow person fills the exams and blames the, blames the teacher. Now that teacher only came three times. True, he came three times. But there are people who are in the same class who understood because the lecture is not coming, he had the syllabus. He was motivated enough to want to study on his own. And he started from his own. Remember the same lecture who can't teach also knows how to make hard exams. Am I right? And they seem to go opposite. <laughs> Good lecturers make easy exams. Bad lecturers make hard exams. So the fact that he doesn't teach does not stop him making a hard exam. You fail, you see the lecturer. It was not the lecturer. You had problems with analytical skills. Number two, you have no motivation. The moment you know who to blame, you stop working. The worst thing in any life is to find someone to blame. The moment you find someone to blame, you are done. I don't know any worst thing that you find somebody to blame. Oh, my young grandfather. Oh, my mother. And if your age has had a, a you know, I have a brother by a bad mother. It's irrelevant. You are now big. Whether it was good or bad is irrelevant. You are now university students. There is no cause you will fail because you are your mother. You will fail because you have no motivation. You know, some people do well and they tell never, you know, I pass away a mom. Then she says nothing. I will fail next month to show her. Now, even if you fail, you do not benefit from failing your mother, isn't it? It is you that will fail. And after all, remember your mother. Most likely you will die when your dad hears I of you. After she is dead and resting, you will still struggle for having to do the She will not suffer. If your failure does not affect you, huh? can you see how foolish it is? But there are people with your own motivation. They have external motivation. Not so. Even if you see they work hard, they are working hard to, you know, to do better than somebody else. So if that's somebody else, if that's bad, they stop working hard. Because after all, they were working hard to be the other person. They are beaten. So for here they fail. Because that year they're working hard, you don't do better than so and so. When we want to this category of people who you need to employ, do not require external motivation. They have a self-drive. They have resilience. 
They never accept a barrier that does not stop them achieving what they feel God has called them to achieve. Once they see a barrier, they ask themselves, God, since you don't need to go over there and have this barrier, do you want me to go over it or under it or even through it? But I must go. They have a drive that causes them to move beyond the immediate problem. You know, there was a time I was moving house to house waiting to see. And my children kept saying, Papa, how do you go to strangers? And you know, that you ask yourself, because some of them actually almost know what I want, what I want. You know, moving from house to house. Some of them feel disturbed. Do you know who we are? Yeah. Then, now, so I told them, there's a motivation, isn't it? And it's inside. When Jesus called me, he said, wait in Jerusalem, when the Holy Spirit come to call you, you will be my witnesses. So it's within. So I don't witness because of the guy is welcoming. I witness because Christ has sent to me. Am I communicating? I don't witness because anybody wants me. After all, only God knows. It's between me and them. If I'm in a hotel, if I'm in a hotel, you know, in a Hilton hotel, in, in a, in a disabapa, nobody knows me. Just between me. Whether I witness or I don't, has nothing to do with anybody. It's, a, it's an eternal Motivation. My friend, people who have this self drive, even if their capacity was lower, <laughs> they still do better than the ones in capacity. Am I going to get it? And that's something some people don't have. They didn't give up. Very easy. That's a small problem. They can't, they can't, they can't, they can't move on. Hmm? They are talking to they are talking to a girl and she looks at him like if he's trash. She will be never talk to another girl unless you have no friend. Yeah, the way girls look at us. You know, her look has nothing to do with your existence. If you know God has said you to her, pray about it and please. When she sneers, remember it cannot eat you. Continue to talk. It requires a lot of I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get it. Yeah. Until you tell me, never talk again. I'll keep talking until you say, don't talk. Looking at me with bad eyes, you look like that thing. I'm not going to get it. Talk! Tell me never to talk to you, I will talk. I'm a Christian, I can't disturb you again. But if it's just okay, that should not be, you cannot eat me. I'm not, I'm not going to get it. Now, these people without this strength, there are many they never achieve just because they are not right. You cannot call yourself a part of excellence. Oh, the lecturer taught us. Oh, the lecturer's English was equal English. I could understand. Surely. Can you start learning to do English so that you understand the lecturer better? I'm not going to get it. Remember, you earn his salary whether you understand or you don't. You still earn his. So who will suffer when you don't understand to do English? You are the suffer, isn't it? So it's important to understand these small barriers do not affect people who have that spirit of excellence and they have an inner drive to achieve. So never stop an exercise or something God has called you to do because it has barriers. Some people have a small barrier that God doesn't want me to go. What about if God wants to use the barrier to heal your pain? Remember the children of Israel were supposed to go to Israel and they would have gone there in a few weeks. God decided to block their way and started taking them to the Red Sea. There they were, I was suffering Sudan. So when I first went to Port Sudan, which is the Red, the Red Sea for Sudan, that's where they export their things from. I said, you see the Red Sea? You know, we always, I always expect it to be red, but it isn't red. So the yes, that's what I hear, it's not a river. You can't see across to the other side of Arabia when you're in Port Sudan, which is the port of uh, the country of Sudan, northern Sudan. And I thought, wow. Can you imagine God brought them into a sea? And they are supposed to go to the other side. And of course, they are not bridges across the seas, are they? So there they were. The Bible tells us the reason He took them through there is not to show them. They really can do nothing about it, but they can depend on God. And God opened the sea and they walked on dry ground. Why? To show them there is no barrier that God cannot lift if it's God sending you. So these people who give up very easily uh, can never have the spirit of excellence. People of excellence continue. You know, some people tell me, no, no, you used to preach once in the campus. You are still preaching. I said, wait a minute. 
Did I give you the impression I was sent by a man who can retire me? I was sent by the Spirit of God, and when he wants me home, he'll call me home. As long as I'm here, I have a job to do. I'm not going to give you. So you need to understand, when you don't have this resilience, ability to go barriers, never to take a no for an answer, but to go to your God and ask, do I go under, over, or through the barrier? To achieve where God has sent you. Of course, I told you the first thing is to be sure God has sent you. If you see who has sent you, you must ask for this ability to go through barriers and to work. And when you see many people who have achieved great things, they don't achieve them because they have their analytical capacity. It's because they don't easily give up. Let me give you another example. Domo Kenyatta. He did a lot of schooling at school in, 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 in Tokoto he, before lunch was there. That's why he started. Then he, then he got a job with a motorbike, doing reading water meters, with the meters in, in, in Nairobi. Then he had his head. These people have no right to be controlling us in Kenya. So way back in the late 1920s, he entered into politics as a young man. And do you know, he went to Britain, imagining that he can tell the Queen to give us independence. He spent, I don't know, how many years in Britain? From late 1920s, early 90s, all the way to mid 1940s, and there was no independence coming. Did he give up? He came back to Kenya to try not to talk to people here, to tell us they are refusing to demand to be pushed. Ah, then the Wazungus were so fed up with him. They arrested him in October 1982, in 1952, when I was getting born. They arrested him and blocked him up for seven years. Then after that, he did seem like he had, he had properly rehabilitated. They put him under house arrest. That's how we know who was born in one of those prisons. <laughs> you know the story, isn't it? Now, do you know when he came out? After all those years, he comes out, I still remember meeting him in 1961, after he came out, I had a Zarani and John Kerr was going to be there as a small boy, I then there, and he was still talking. Was almost must go. All those years, he never gave up. By the time he came out, he was an old man. In fact, he became younger as he became president. But the guy who came out of prison, so I've been out some tea and we looked at an old old man when I saw him in 1961-62. My friend, the reason we got independence in Kenya is because there was a guy who never gave up. Now, if you really want to be the man or woman of excellence, God is after. You must get this second thing of never giving up. Call it resilience, care is inner motivation, call it self drive, but something once you are sure God has sent you, you don't give up. Are we together? That's just you are studying and you get an exam. They say, really, just tells me how to pass. You go back and do the same exam. If you get a second time, you still go back. You don't give up. Why you know God sent you to this university to pass? The fact that you have failed just means there's something he wants you to understand better. So don't give up because you get an exam. You continue. Am I going to get it? The same way that a boy tells you no doesn't mean you'll never marry. It just means you will not marry that time. Am I going to get it? Yeah. 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 Okay, you have been told no by five. But that's too few. There are about a million men around who love the Lord. There's still somebody. Am I going to get it? I will never marry. Who told you? If the Lord has called you to marriage, you might discover not now, but when you are in your forties, but you still come. I'm not going to get it. I know you don't want to hear that, but it's important to understand the people that do exploits are people who don't easily. So the first thing, you must have an analytical mind. Don't just accept anything that you see. The second one is, you don't need to give up. And don't rely on external motivation. Have self given by God, not by the bishop, not by the pastor, not by your mother. Those people will die. And you'll be left here on your own. Then what happens to your motivation? Will it go to the grave with your mother? You need a motivation that's not tied up to a human being. Because they come and go. Can we go to the third one? Yes. 
that if you do the Araman of Exodus, it will be very, very important that you become a man who is not only analytical, not a person, not just a person who has trained, but a person who has interpersonal skills. They know how to relate with others. When you listen to the first service, you hear I talk about Jesus green in favor with men. Social skills. I very really people. Let me tell you again. You cannot achieve much, even if you are analytical and you have prayed, if you don't know how to relate with the people. You know, initially I thought that there's a job you can do, even if you don't know how to relate with people. In fact, when we did first day, and we used to say I was a big call, and we were saying, if you don't like relating with people, you better be an accountant. Those of us who like relating, we think that there was a doctor called business administration or computer science. Was a, uh, everything in person was compulsory. It's in second and third year when you could make some, you could make some stretches in our course for only for three years. How wrong I was. Did I know that once you're an accountant and provide some accounting work, everything that belongs to somebody, somebody brings a voucher <laughs> because he wants to claim some money to go for a trip. You can have it there. If you delay the voucher, you have a poor amount to the paper by the one who wants the money. My community, I discovered there is no job or life which can be done by people who don't want to know how to relate with others. And even if they, like for example, let's say you are going to be a vet. Is there animal science in this university? Do you study animal science? It's not taught here. Let's assume there's something like animal science, veterinary science. So you think that I'll be a vet because that way I don't have to relate with the people. You are lying to yourself. The moment you qualify as a vet, you set up a vet clinic. No cow will ever come on its own. <laughs> no dog will ever come on its own. They are always brought by human beings. And where your clinic grows depends on how you talk with the owners. A woman brings a cat and starts telling you the story of what's happening with the cat. You tell you, you don't like talking. Say, no, no, no. Mama, I'm a scientist. I can handle the cat. Just go. I will leave you when I bring you the car. Say, no, no, I just want to tell you where, how it was repaid. No, I, I can handle You don't want to talk to her. You train her to treat the car. And the car is not great. When after the car is back and jumping and you can see the car is healthy, you are supposed to throw me my car. No, no, don't worry, that's a scientific matter. Take your car, pay over there. Let me ask you. The next time that lady goes to another, another vet who is not as good, you, you have a, a master of science in veterinary science. The next clinic, the guy is from a hippie. He has a diploma. But he knows how to talk to the owner of the car. And the car is coming. Sometimes I tell him the lady, Madam, hey, your car is very I tell you, I don't think really you know the history of this type of car. You really select it well. Now, what do you think the lady is feeling? <laughs> All right. What's wrong with your car? She tells the wrong story, she's not being too strong. Then she says, Madam, you can keep checking on me. Ring me whenever you want. I'll tell you the progress I'm making. Work in the car. But it's not as good as Andy's, like the other one. The other one takes only one day. In the evening, you say, No, no, you are cut. I'm still working on the car. Because you're still looking at the books to find out how to diagnose the problem. So you have to stay there in the clinic and an extra day. But the mama says, Even if you take three days, <laughs> you know, you are not treating the car, you are treating the, the one of the car. Now, give me no time. The cat is okay. Tell me, where will the lady be taking her cat in the future? The MSc or the diploma? I'm not going to get it. Can you see how critical interpersonal skills are for any excellence? Many teachers can never be good teachers. Why? They bark at their students. I didn't say talk, bark like a dog. <laughs> but they call first class honors in physics at Murama University of Science and Technology. Is that what it's called? My friend, no teacher. Every time the students see you, they freeze. They can't even know what you are saying. It's wonderful, you have wonderful knowledge. You have wonderful knowledge, but they cannot move from your head to the students' head. Another one comes. We just got a pass. <laughs> and they're teaching the same subject. And they come by saying, hey, my students, how are you this morning? I hope you had a good day. You know, I hear a guy coming to teach you. You are the most handsome class I've ever taught in my life. 
so far, not to explain God. Am I we just talking to them? He is treating them. But the time we come to face it, they are ready to hear. They pass better than the other one. He has wait a minute. This rich man passed the corners. This one got a pass. Why are they passing? Because of interpersonal And I can tell you, however gifted analytically you are, however much you have a drive, if you don't know how to deal with the people, see there is no job you can ever do alone. Even scientists, they do in teams. And if you don't know how to work in teams, your project will never pass. You will never be a Nobel laureate because you, your projects will never achieve what they are supposed to achieve. Because your own teammates will sabotage your projects because of the way you talk to them. Not very really So you need to understand that that's why Christians, if they have to obey the Bible, they will be the best scientists, the best leaders, the best managers, because they easily can have all the three together. Am I going to You know, if you are called in the personal skills, even if you are not capacity, you are honest enough to admit you don't have it. So what do you do? You allow your juniors who are brighter than you to do certain things. What about if you are not good in the personal skills? You feel you are made bad. So you pretend to know what you don't? So will, it, will there be progress? No. So the personal skills allows you like I was saying, the first service allows you to accept yourself, but number two, it allows you to know other people and accept them, and so be able to deal with them. So anybody who is going to achieve anything can't have all of them are required. And the more you have the day, the greater the possibilities that you have a life of excellence. And analytical skills allow you to think highly and think about all the things need to be done and how they can be solved. Your drive allows you not to give up easily. Your interpersonal skills allows you to work as a team player and so be able to achieve more. You know, the only thing, the only business you can run alone is called a kiosk. Where you are the CEO and you are also the messenger. That's called a what do you call that business? A kiosk. Am I right? The moment you want to do big business, you can't do it alone. You must do it with others. And that's where the interpersonal skills comes in. So you need to be analytical, you need to have the drive because values will be many, but at the same time, you need to be somebody who knows how to live with others. Who is sure who they are themselves, they are not looking at others to define them, but they also accept others the way they are, and are able to work in a team, even if the other people are not exactly the way they are. Maybe your teammate is very happy. But that's irrelevant because there is no, it's not a big the contest. So you accept them exactly as they are. Ah, I think you don't have the personal skills. Every time you see this ugly boy, you are assure him. Why can't you go to work in another thing? By not accepting him and he has brains, you are failing to get analytical help because of the size of his nose. Is that wise? No. So you need to have all the three together. Am I clear? And those are, unfortunately, are not things available in the lectures. Am I right? Yes. They are not available in the lectures. Yet, without them, there is no way you become a success. That's why people with PhDs, if you give them any work, they can't achieve anything. Because the PhD is trying to help them become analytical. But if they have not tried, they give up easily. If they have no interpersonal skills, they are too proud. The other day I was introducing I was introducing oh, my friend is a vice chancellor of a university and we're in a wedding. So this other boy who is a professor came nearby. And uh, so I introduced this is Dr. So and so. And then I told I didn't add that he's a vice chancellor of a university. Then uh, this other guy had said he is Dr. So and so. You know what the young man told me? Brother man, I tell them the truth. I'm not just Dr. So and so. I'm Professor So and so. I don't be embarrassing. This guy is a vice chancellor. He is only an associate professor. But he wants everybody to know. Because he thinks he is defined by his title. And who is a professor? A senior teacher. Just like if you are in management, a senior manager. So the fact that senior manager is not called Mr. Senior Manager 
you insist on being called a professor. Just shows you don't understand that these are titles within one career. They are titles within a different career. The fact that I haven't given the details. Now, you, when you have that pride, it will make you look down on people who will help you. Am I going to give you? Maybe the next day you'll be looking for a job with the vice chancellor. Is he going to get when he remembers how he behaved? No. So you need to understand that the Christian, if he is to obey the scriptures, many doors will open that will not have opened otherwise. That we are talking about the spirit of excellence. And um, I'm taking my time. We have, we have, we have to find a way of, of finishing. Um, but I hope I'm communicating. So to, all these things are not the same things I shared in the in the first service. So I would like to ask you to tell the people in the second service, uh, in the first service, to remember to look for the recording of the second. Isn't that fair? Because they don't know that I'm not repeating what I say in the other one. But you, you have heard. Our text was both in in the Christianity chapter 3, but also I quoted Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Acts chapter 13, verse 36. For David, after he had served his own papa, his own generation, by the will of God, fell and on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Basically, we are learning about the life of excellence from David. David took everything he did seriously. Initially, he was just a shepherd boy, young boy being sent, but he says he looked after his father's sheep. When a bear came, a small boy as he was, he killed a lion. You have heard the story, isn't it? Another time a lion did, he told the lion, a small boy. So when God had came, he had learned that he believes in a God who gives him resilience. So he told David, how can you allow this uncircumcised Philistine to be insulting our God? Our God! But the guy can't even wear the armor. I'm sure you know the story of David and Goliath, isn't it? When he went and he was given big arms, he says, no, 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 no. I know how to go to him. The same way I went to the lion. The same way I went through the, the bear. I got it. So he took his uh, small thing with a few stones. And the guy came and said, you are it. You think I'm a, what do you think I am? You are coming to fight me without any sword, without anything. The boy said, you are coming to me in your name. I'm coming in the name. That's what the resilience is all about. The guy, six something feet, almost seven feet, was not frightening the small boy. Took the stones, aimed, and it landed right in the middle of the head. The guy, the guy goes down. Of course, the boy has no sword. He took the Goliath sword and cut the head and go the head high. Had he won? Yes. That is the life of excellence we are discussing today. Because the reason why he was fighting God here, at the risk of his own life, was because of the name of the Lord. Are we together? And that's what you need to have at the back of your mind. As I go to us finishing, let me emphasize, you cannot be a man of excellence without that idea of not giving up. What I call diligence, hard work, is, which is expected of every Christian anyway. So laziness and Christian must never be used in the same sentence. A lazy Christian is a contradiction of terms. You cannot be a Christian and lazy at the same time. It is condemned. By the way, laziness in the scriptures is more condemned than drunkenness. Of course, both will be in hell. But both of them are condemned. The interesting thing is, if somebody, if somebody drank him drunk here, we can very easily, our ashes will get him out. Am I right? If a drunkard came here, will the ashes allow him here? He'll be taken out. Yet, seated next to you is a lazy girl. And you are doing nothing about it. Because laziness, according to us, laziness is okay, drunkenness is not. But the scriptures are clear. When people are in hell, they ask each other, why are you here? And you, why are you here? One will say, because I was lazy. The other one, because I'm drunk. They will be in the same hell, same temperature. It will not matter. <laughs> one of them was lazy, the other one was? You cannot claim to have a life of excellence when you're always looking for short corners, short corners, and how to, do, how to bypass something without doing it right. Christian people of excellence, 
follow the way through with diligence. And I think that's something very, very important. You know, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Why? Why was Adam put in the garden of Eden? Read it. To work it and to take care of it. NIV. Genesis 2, 15. The curse is in Genesis chapter 3. You know that, isn't it? Here, there's no fall of fall. But even before the fall, in the garden of Eden, the man still had to work. The only difference is that there were no weeds. When the curse came, a lot of thorns started growing in the garden. But work is not a curse. Am I communicating? We were created to work. Just go and read it on your own slowly so that you can see it's not me. Genesis 2.15. Man was created to do what? To work. So my friend, the idea of laziness, eating what you have not worked for, is one way of booking a location in hell. In fact, he says, if you don't work, don't eat. In other words, die. You are not allowed to be in Mongedo. Ever heard of a place called Mongedo? Where you just sit there watching people, doing nothing. In the evening, you go and ask your mother for food, just because you are a university student. If any time you are given Ugali to eat, find out, did I work? If you never worked, don't eat it. Because you may be booking a place in hell. I'm not communicating. Because the word is, the same Bible that says don't commit adultery. It says don't eat unless you are. Some people are in hell. Some will be there because they ate without working. So you must ask yourself before you eat, have I worked? And by the way, studies is hard work. Am I right? So ask yourself, did I work? Don't just eat. And don't blame your mother. Your mother doesn't know that you worked. She will give you food even if you never worked. But the Lord knows that you never worked. It's important to understand if your life of excellence, a life of excellence hates free things. A life of excellence hates the idea of getting things or eating for something you have not worked for. Because God created us to work, and when we work, we are there for serving Him. Look at 1 Timothy 15, chapter 5, verse 13. Besides, they get in the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things they ought not to do. These people that are not, don't have the spirit of excellence are idlers. My friend, rest is okay, but it must be planned rest. And the formula is simple. You have to work six days to one day of rest. Not the other way around. You rest six days, you have to work for one day. The scripture requires most of our time is used doing what? Working. But these people are idle. They, in fact, they are given another name, both busy bodies. My friend, you must structure your time. That my, and I'm not very old, I told you, I'm just about 70. I, I, I must structure my time. I can't just sit there because I, do, I don't pay school fees. Sit there doing nothing. I must structure my time so each day I cannot be described as being idle. Because idle people are going to hell. Am I communicating? The Muzungu was right. It's not in the Bible. Muzungu was right. Idle minds are the devil's workshop. The devil likes working in minds that are idle. Always structure your time. Even if you are jobless, ask yourself, what can I do during the jobless time? that I'll remember later. You cannot afford to be idle. And that hatred of being idle will cause you to become an inventor of things. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. Make it your ambition. And if you read all the way to verse 12, it says, finally, not to be dependent on others. That is First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12. It should be ambition not to be dependent on others. Scriptures. So if you are eating your father's sweat, are you dependent upon him? It was okay to be dependent on your father before you are 20. After 20, you are an adult. Work with your own hands. If you are staying in your uncle's place and you don't have some work, just tell him from now onwards, don't wash your car in town. I'll be waking up early in the morning to wash the car. 
That time when you wash his car, when your aunt gives you gari, twangari, because he cannot go to hell, because you washed the car. But being idle, but I'm not a houseboy. You are, my friend, how would you go to hell in order to be called a houseboy? It's important you don't are not idle. Make it your ambition not to be dependent on others. It is not Christian to enjoy depending on others. Of course, it is important for us to help one another. So I should help you, but you should be refusing my help. Are you seeing the difference? We are not suggesting we don't help others. We are suggesting to them they should refuse our help. The idea of begging, seeking people's help is not right. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, Paul is talking, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Verse 33. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourself, he is telling the church, know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself saying, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That is the meaning of people of excellence. They hate free things. They do not want free things. Galatians 6 actually explains this. Look at verse 2. It says, carry each other's burdens. But skip over to verse 5. For each one who should carry his own, within one five, five verses, the Bible seems to contradict itself. The Bible is telling you to carry your own load in verse 5. But in verse 2, tells others to help you to carry it. Have you seen the two messages? So you as a person should not want anybody to help you carry the load. We are supposed to carry our own load and then seek for somebody who needs our help. So it's important to be helpful to one another, but it's not good for the person to be waiting for help. Are we getting the picture? So what are we saying? In order to be what Christ is telling you in verse, back to verse as well in chapter 4, mind your own business is what you are told. The first time I read it, I said, that's rude. But you see, people of excellence mind their own business. Oh, you know that girl, oh, her English is like low English. I don't know, I can't even understand her. Now, what about the continue working with your good English? Don't be don't make other people's business your business. The only way you stop getting involved in other businesses is by having your own business. Do some co 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 creative, creative work and do not be motivated by competition. You are not trying to be better than others. You are trying to be yourself. In other, in other words, do not Make other people's business your business, have your own business. And those are the people I'm calling people of excellence who do them. And then the other thing this verse says, and I want you to go and read it slowly on your own. We are seeing the verse chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. It says, Work with your own hands. No, there are people who are con men. They feel very clever that the guy worked, I took his money. I'm a broker, I just broke. What do you add value? Nothing, but I cheat them and they give me all the money. No. That's not work. Your work must add value. If somebody pays you, then it must be for something you contributed, not by conning others. That's what I'm saying. Work with your own hands. Don't let others work and then you gather from them. Because God blesses the work of your hands. And that is very, very, very important for you to understand. My, my, time, is, my time is up. But I want to just mention that all we are saying is can be summarized in four sentences. Number one, to understand short work dishonors God. Short work dishonors God. So you are not going to be short, not because of what the lecturer does or does not do, but because God can see your work. Short work dishonors God. Number two, that when you have a spirit of excellence. And so you never do any short service or short work. 
it will, you will be a blessing to others. And you are created to be a blessing to others. Are we together? Number three, we have learned that excellence is not in one area. Excellence must be in all areas. So you cannot be saying you are excellent here and not excellence here. You must be excellent in everything. That we are saying the first service, that's how Jesus grew. Luke chapter 2, verse 4, 52. He grew in terms of physical stature, in terms of wisdom, in terms of social work, in terms of favor with God. All areas must be excellent. And then finally, what we are saying, and it is very important, you should do your dance to the audience of one, God. Don't worry about the people. Do people clap for you or not clap for you? What matters? Did God clap for you? And that when you, your motivation is inside, it's by between you and God, you will always be able to go right up to the end. Let's pray together. As I pray, maybe you need my prayer, but start by praying for yourself. Is there something the Holy Spirit is saying and you are preventing something needs to change in your life? The first thing must be that you are willing to repent your sins. Tell God to forgive you. Because only Him can help you to have this spirit of excellence. So that in your academic work, you do your very best with yourself. In your social life, you become a blessing to others. In your relationships, people will desire to be in your team. So it starts by you admitting that you need God's help. I want you to go before God and tell God, forgive me. I want you to be the master of my life and rule with it for the rest of my life. And number two, maybe you are a Christian, you are born again, but there's a place, a specific life part of your life that Holy Spirit is mentioning that needs to change. Tell God, even this one, today I'm willing to surrender. I want you to take it over and help that I may truly be forgiven. And start living a life of excellence. And finally, maybe there's something that you have done for yourself motivated by selfishness rather than to the glory of God. Telling God, yes, I know I'm good in this, but I've been seeking my own glory. I want you to forgive me and take over my life so that you'll be linked to honor you to the audience of one. If you are praying for yourself and you also want me to pray for you as I finish, just put up your hand once I see it, put it down. You are telling God, yes, that was my message, I accept it. Just put it high enough the Lord bless you. Somebody else? The Lord bless you. 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 Outside, put it high enough. The Lord bless you. Thank you very much. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you up here. Don't put up a second time. Is there anybody else? The Lord bless you. I'm asking Peter to come and pray for us that the Lord will not only forgive us but help us to live this life of excellence. Let us pray. For your peace, we want to thank you for this opportunity you've given us to hear your word. And thank you for using your servants to speak.